Yeah, here's one of the guys who can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, oh. you, you call your mother or something? Oh, right you got to get back yeah. 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 Uh, for the past couple of minutes, it has been clear from this uh, space back on Chambers in that area. So now they're walking back toward the World Trade Center. And as we keep letting you hear the personal stories, the survivor stories of exactly what happened inside the World Trade Center when that first plane went in, and of course the collapses since then, we're going to bring more of those to you now. Barry Jennings, you're on the eighth floor. You work for the City Housing Department. Explain to me the moment of impact. Well, me and Mr. Hesch, the Corporation Council, were on the 23rd floor. I told them we got to get, get out of here. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. And I turned to Hesh. I, I said, this is it. We're dead. We're, we're not going to make it out of here. I took uh, a fire extinguisher and I bust the window out. This is when this gentleman, this gentleman here heard my cries for help. This gentleman right here. And he said, kept, kept saying, stand by. Somebody's coming to get you. They, could, they couldn't get to us for an hour because they couldn't find us. You thought that was it? I thought, I thought we're dead. I thought that was it. I, I started praying to Allah. I said, that's it. We're gone. Well, what was it like for you? You were inside there as well. It was pandemonium. I mean, it was something like out of a uh, uh, Bruce Willis Die Hard movie. Uh, he was there and he was crying and there was another gentleman crying and, and for help. We couldn't get to him. We tried to get through the, uh, we, we went through the buildings. We were lost. Both staircases, the backside was completely blown away. There was no way to access us. We couldn't get to him. And finally, uh, one, of the, one of the fire department teams found him. But, uh, we didn't think we didn't think they were going to make it. Well, certainly you got out. Many others didn't. Of course, we don't have a number right now of fatalities or injuries. But I want to translate a story to you that another man told me. He was near the building. He was on the lobby level near the shopping area, near the promenade. The elevator doors, he said to me, blew open. And when the doors opened, there was a man on fire inside that elevator. That is the kind of tragedy we are talking about here and where the world. <laughs> We've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted, whether in fact there wasn't something else at the base of the towers that in fact were the coup de grace to bring them to the ground. When you're down there, Dan, you hear smaller secondary explosions going off every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and, and so it is an extremely dangerous place to be. And I'm surrounded by firefighters who are just watching helplessly. They've had to, to suspend their rescue operation, and they're just watching a burning hulk of building right now. The, uh, the front part of the World Trade Center has completely sheared off, as well as many of the upper floors. And every few minutes you'll hear it like a small sort of a rumbling sound, almost like an explosion sound, and another chunk of it will come flying down into the street. Uh, Rick Sanchez has been there throughout this morning. I spoke with some police officials moments ago, Chris, and they told me that they have reason to believe that one of the explosions at the World Trade Center, aside from the ones that may have been caused by the impact of the plane with the building, may have been caused by a van that was parked in the building that may have had some type of explosive device in it. So their fear is that there may have been explosive device planted either in the building or in the adjacent area, and that's why they're being so caught. Hi, my name is Barry Jennings. Um, I'm 52 years old. Um, I've worked for, for 33 years at one location. Um, basically, like I said I'm married, uh, father of uh, four. And that's it. Why don't you tell people uh, your experience from the very beginning of the day on September 11, 2001? All right. It, it was, as I told you guys before, it's very, it was very uh, funny. I was on my way to work, and. Uh, traffic was excellent. I received a call that uh, a small Cessna had hit the uh, World Trade Center. And I was asked to go and uh, man the uh, Office of Emergency Management at the World Trade Center 7 on the 23rd floor. As I arrived there, there were police all in the lobby. They, um, they showed me the way to the elevator. We got up to the uh, 23rd floor. Me and Mr. Hess, who I didn't know was Mr. Hess at the time, we got to the 23rd floor. Uh, we couldn't get in. We had to go back down. Then security and police took us to the freight elevators where they took us back up and we did get in. Upon arriving into the OEM uh, EOC, we noticed that everybody was gone. I saw coffee that was on a desk. Still, the smoke was still coming off the coffee. I saw, I saw, uh, 
have eaten sandwiches. And only me, Mr. Hess, was up there. Um, after I called several individuals, one individual told me that um, to leave and leave right away. Mr. Hess came running back in and said, we're the only ones up here, we got to get out of here. He found the stairwell. So we, we subsequently went to the stairwell and we're going. Um, after I called several individuals, one individual told me that um, to leave and leave right away. Mr. Hess came running back in and said, we're the only ones up here, we got to get out of here. He found the stairwell. So we, we subsequently went to the stairwell and we're going down the stairs. When we reached the eighth or the sixth floor, the landing that we were standing on gave way. There was an explosion and the landing gave way. And we're, I was left there hanging. I had to climb back up and now I had to walk back up to the eighth floor. After getting to the eighth floor, everything was dark. It was dark and it was very, very hot. Very hot. Um, I asked Mr. Hess to test the phones as I took a fire extinguisher and broke out the windows. Once I broke out the windows, I could see outside below me, I saw uh, police cars on fire, buses on fire. Uh, I looked one way, the building was there. I looked the other way, it was gone. Um, I was trapped in there for several hours. I was trapped in there when, when both buildings came down. Um, the firefighters came, they came to the window, and because I was going to come out on the fire hose. I didn't want to stay there any longer. It was too hot. I was going to come out on the fire hose. They came to the window and they said, they started yelling, do not do that. You won't hold you. And then they ran away. See, I didn't know what was going on. That's when one, the first tower fell. When they started running, the first tower was coming down. I had no, I had no way of knowing that. Then I saw them come back. Now I saw them come back with more concern on their faces. And then they ran away again. The second tower fell. So w w as they turned and ran the second time, the guy said, don't worry, we'll be back for you. And they did come back. This time they came back with 10 firefighters. Um, and they kept asking, where are you? We don't know where you are. I said, I'm on the north side of the building because when I was on the stairs, I saw north side. Excuse me. Uh, all this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. All this time, I'm hearing explosions. And I'm thinking that maybe it's the uh, buses around me that were on fire, the cars are on fire. But I don't see no, you know, but I'm still hearing these explosions. When they finally got to us and they took us down to what, what they they uh, called the lobby because I asked them, I said, when we got down there, I said, where are we? He said, this was the lobby. And I said, you got to be kidding me. It was total ruins. Total ruins. Now keep in mind, when I came in there, the lobby had nice escalators. It was a huge lobby. And for me to see what I saw, it was unbelievable. And the firefighter that took us down kept saying, do not look down. And I kept saying, why? He said, do not look down. And we were stepping over people. And you know you can feel when you're stepping over people. They took us out through a hole that the, I don't know who made this hole in this wall. That's how they got us out. They took us out through a hole, through the wall, to safety. As they were taking me out, one firefighter had fallen. I believe he was having a heart attack. But before that, this big giant police officer came to me. And he says, you have to run. I said, I can't run, my knees are swollen. He said, you're gonna have to get on your knees and crawl in. He said, because we have reports of more explosions. And that's when I started crawling. And I saw this guy fall behind me. And his comrades came to his aid. They dragged him to safety. Um, I was looking for, for an ambulance for my knees. And at that time, they told me, we well, gotta walk 20 blocks to a um, to refuge. Uh, before I got there, I would this news grabbed me and started interviewing me. Um, and that, that's basically it. Now, real quick, I'd like, if possible, for you to elaborate on... Now, you originally said on ABC7 that you got to the 8th floor, and that's where the explosion was, and that's what blew you off. And there you said you got down to the 6th floor. Well, it was the 8th no, the floor we got back into. Okay. 
The sixth floor is what we got down to. Okay, so you made it all the way down from the 23rd floor. To all the, the, sixth, the floor. sixth floor. Right, that's and when the explosion was, happened. Now, can, where did that originate from? Did the explosion come from under you? Was under, it, it was definitely under us. It was from under you. It okay. definitely was under us. Now, did it like lift you up? Is that? Yeah, it, it blew, it blew, it blew, it blew, it blew, it blew us back. And then I found myself, I thought I was on a stair landing. Uh -huh. But I wasn't, I found myself hanging on. So you want me to, to go into that? If you could. Yeah, sure, yeah. You sure. It was pitch black. You can see anything. Right, right. If, if you could please elaborate on yeah, that. Sure. Just quickly. Okay, um, when I made it to the sixth floor, and, and, and the, there was an explosion, the explosion was beneath me. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind now, it's pitch black in there. All the lights went out. Yeah. So when the explosion happened, it blew us back. I'm thinking I'm standing on, a, on, on the landing. I'm actually holding on to a pole above us really? and I had to climb back up because Hess is yelling what do we do now I said there's only one thing we can do is and it's go back up so that's when we went back up to the eighth floor and I busted out that window my other question was gonna be you said sure. that you'd worked in the office of emergency management since its inception in 99 could you just tell people what the OEM was and your experiences with it like how, how often you would be there what the job of the OEM was okay Excellent. When, when when the office of emergency management did an activation they always they always included our locale, uh -huh. and what it what it what what we did was what they did was monitor the emergency. They actually coordinated the emergency through several agencies, and that's what we did. We were there as part of I was there as part of one of my agencies, which I can't I can't name. Of course. And um, we would sit there and we would do uh, sit reports. We would get updates as far as the emergency that was on hand. And that's simply what we would do. Every agency that was involved in that emergency was there. Okay. And, and that was a man 24 hours, I've heard? When the, the activation, only when there was an emergency activation was that man 24 hours. Okay. OEM was man 24 hours without the activation. When they opened up the, OE, the, the EOC, that was activated for as long as the emergency was uh, going on. Once the emergency was was subsided then they would you know they would they would stand down okay my other question was they had a drill in preparations called tripod did you know anything about tripod that was down at the pier at all yes i was yeah. i was i was part of that are you, you were part of tripod yes. discuss that at all yeah can yes. you discuss any aspects of tripod well the only thing the only thing i remember is tripod was we did a uh, a drill which was uh supposed to be a, a man-made disaster a terrorist attack and it was supposed to be some kind of chemical and all they did was drill, they went through the whole uh, steps of what, what you would do here, if you'd come here, how you would, you know, they went through the whole thing. And we were just part, of, we were just actually, we were just viewing it. We were just part of the viewers. Okay. That was it. We wasn't part of the actual, we would just view the individuals. Just monitoring the results of the action. And from right. media reports, we've heard that it was supposed to take place on the 12th, but preparations were before that. In other words, throughout the week, they'd been manning the separate stations. Do you know when they, when it was actually, like, in progress? Because you said you, you'd been part of it and seen it. So obviously, there was something going on before the 12th. Like, did you observe this in, like, the 10th, the 11th, like, right prior to 9-11? No. No, this, no. this was after? Yes. Our, our, our participation was after. It was after 9-11? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, then can you just uh, give us permission to use it? Say louder than words can use this footage. Yes, you can use this footage. All right. But awesome. real quick, I, I'd you like for you to elaborate question? on a few things. Sure. What time approximately did you arrive at World Trade Center 7? Um, I'm just trying to establish a timeline. The, 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 I, I received a call shortly after the the first plane hit, which we, we thought, which everyone thought was a Cessna. That's what I was told. A small Cessna lost its way and hit the plane. I got there... Uh, I had to be inside on the 23rd floor when the second plane hit. Okay. I was inside when the second plane hit. I was already in the uh, uh, World Trade Center 7. Okay. When the you, second didn't, plane. you didn't hear that after the fact. Or did you hear that when it happened? The second plane when it hit? I couldn't tell you because I was inside and I was like closed off from everything. Keep in mind now, OEM, uh -huh. the biggest, that big center, they had big gigantic TV screens. And at that point, none of them were working. So I didn't know what was going on, on the outside. Mm -hmm. So the, the building was essentially deserted when you and Mr. Hess, well, the command center was deserted when you and Mr. Hess got up there? Yes. Was that normal? No. No? No. Okay. No, not at all. They, they, uh, the word we got was they, they, um, they had to take the mayor and evacuate. Mm -hmm. So they, you, they said that the mayor was in World Trade Center 7 that day? Yes. 
he was there earlier in the day yes. and then a vacuum. Yes. Could you say that because we're because we're not Mike? Can you say that Giuliani was in the building? I didn't actually see him, uh -huh. but that's what I was told. That's why Hess was there. Okay. He was there to meet with uh, Giuliani. Um, okay. That's about all I've got going. No, I know. I just feel like there's something I'm missing. What's your impression with Building Seven and your and your experience in working there? What kind of vibe did you get from that building? You know that there was the CIA there, obviously. There was the Department of Defense. The Secret Service was there. IRS. IRS was there. Well, I'm just confused about one thing and one thing only. Why World Trade Center 7 went down in the first place. I'm very confused about that. I know what I heard. I heard explosions. The, the, the um, expl explanation I got was it was the uh, fuel oil tank. I'm an old boiler guy. If it was a fuel oil tank, it would have been one side of the building. When I got to that lobby, the lobby was totally destroyed. It looked like King Kong had came through it and stepped on it. And I, it was so destroyed, I didn't know where I was. And it was so destroyed, they had to take me out to a hole in the wall, a makeshift hole that I believe the fire department made to get me out. Me and Mr. Hess out. I do have one more question. Did sure. you ever talk to people from the 9-11 Commission, the Congressional Report, FBI, NIST, anybody? You did speak with them. Yes. Who did you speak with? Um, they called me down. Which one? They were doing, um, it was, I, think it was, um, I, don't know, I think it was part of the 9-11 Commission. So okay. it, was it the hearings at the new school? No. No? No. I can't tell you where it was because... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh, but they called me down there and they, they asked me the same questions that you guys are asking. And... Um, at that point, they said, okay, thank you. They really? sent me on my way. And yeah, you told them pretty much everything you just told us. Yes. That you were in the building, got rocked by an explosion, yes. all that. Yes. And you know that they didn't mention Building 7 once in the commission report. I told them that's where I was. <laughs> no, that's I where I was. But you, you know that they didn't mention the building at all. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give it too much thought. Uh-huh. I thought they were just, do I thought they were just doing, a, you know, an into a report or an investigation on, as to what happened. They got my point of view. And, I, ha I haven't heard any more from them. All right, excellent. So you, you don't feel that you've gotten a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation for what happened inside that building? No. Not at all? That, 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 the, the, the explanation that I got was a fuel oil tank. No. No? No. So I heard the explosions. And, I, and, and then the key thing was when the police officer came to me, he said, we got reports of more explosions, so you have to run. Uh-huh. Big talk. And that's after both towers have fell, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Now, to your recollection, <clears throat> excuse me. To your recollection, did the explosion on the sixth floor happen before the first tower collapsed, or the second one, or before both? Because I remember, I remember you said earlier you were actually trapped when both of them came down. I'm still in the building when both of them came down. You're still in the building. Do you, are you trapped on the sixth floor when the buildings came down? Yes. 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 So it's safe to say that that explosion on the sixth floor happened before either tower fell. It definitely happened before our tower. I, 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 the towel fell, and I'll tell you why. Barry, I'm sorry, can you just wait for that job? Sure. Because this is vital. Because the whole, the whole official story, the whole reason that Building 7 collapsed, allegedly, is because the North Tower fell onto it and caused damage. And what people are going to say is, they're going to say, well, Barry was hit by debris from the North Tower. No. What happened was, when we made it back to the 8th floor, as I told you earlier, Yes. Both buildings were still standing because I looked two, I looked one way, looked the other way, now there's nothing there. When I got to the sixth floor before all this happened, when I got to the sixth floor, there was an explosion. That's what forced us back to the eighth floor. Okay. Both buildings were still standing. Keep in mind, I told you the fire department came and ran. They came twice. Why? Because building tower one fell, then tower two fell. And then when they came back, they came back with all concern now, like to get me the hell out of there. And, and they did. And we got out of there. I got in the building way before, a little before nine, a little after nine. That, that, I didn't get out of there until like one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because the news report with Michael Hess was approximately right. around 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. Man, Barry, is there anything else you want to say? I mean, is there anything you want to clear up? Well, you know, uh, I like to say that, you know, uh, my mind is still there. You know, um, that day I'll never forget. And the, the explanations that were given to me is totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. 
because as I stated, I was there. I lived it. I lived through it. Actually, I thought I was going to die that day because me and Michael Hess did get on our knees and start praying when we saw that there was nobody coming. There was no hope. We did get on our knees and start praying. Uh, and then there was a fireman that shined the light and says, anybody in here? Those are the sweetest words I ever heard. Is there anybody in here? And, and I, at that time, I told Mike, I said, Mike, you better get under the desk and pray to who you're going to pray to because I'm going to pray to who I'm going to pray to because it doesn't look like we're going to make it. And that's when the fireman came and, and saved our lives. Excellent. And you got out of the building around 1 o'clock, and that's when you pretty much crawled out on your knees. And that's when you see Seth and caught you, right? Yes, now. yes, yes. And then... There's really no, been no official follow-up with you, right? I mean, obviously the 9 Commission invited you to come testify, and that was it. I mean, you never heard anything back from that? No. No. I mean, I got several calls from several news reporters, and uh, News 12 did come out to my home and interview me as far as what took place. But that was it. That was it. And it wasn't until some years later that I testified in front of them. It was, And it was... It was very, uh, to tell you, it was very scary because they, they, they looked like very important people. Yeah. They were questioning me about certain things. And, um, I don't know if they liked the answers I gave. I can pretty, I, I can care less. I gave what I, my account of it, the truth, and that was it. When did you first start doubting? Well, did you have your doubts that day as to why? Well, did you even see Building Seven come down at all? But you were probably, you were probably well no, gone by then. No, I was long gone by then. When did I you first hear it collapsed? And to my surprise, uh, I was um, back in back in the office. Uh, uh, secretaries and things that were cleaning me up. I was disheveled. I even started crying uh, because of you know the lives that were lost and and. I was lucky enough to get to get out of there. When I got home, I sat down in front of the TV and I, my wife said, why do you keep watching this? Why do you keep, I couldn't stop watching it. And that's when I found out Building 7 came down. I was so surprised. And I'm saying to myself, why did that building come down? And I knew why it came down because of the explosions. And it was not no fuel oil tanks. We heard another explosion, and I'm assuming that's the one that came from the, the lower level, since there were two, and I thought... Right, because it was like 18 minutes apart. Well, this is, you know, the first, the first explosion, and there was a second explosion in the same building. There were two explosions. Okay. Federal agencies that were down there do believe that there was some sort of explosive device somewhere else besides the planes. Tell me how you're feeling. How did you get there? What happened to you? Um, I was, I worked for the train center, one of the carpenters, and uh, I was going to go do a job. And um, I got on the elevator, and the freight elevator, and I heard the first um, explosion, and the elevator blew up, the doors blew up, and it dropped. And um, I was lucky that the uh, elevator got caught between two floors that... Which floors? The B levels, the basement levels, with all the you know all the mechanics on. There was another big, big explosion in the other house. Flames coming out of this billowing grey smoke. People still not panicking. People not quite understanding what was going on. Then somebody said that they saw an airliner going to one of those towers. Made it to the sixth floor. And 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 the. There was an explosion. The explosion was beneath me. Keep in mind now, it's pitch black in there. All the lights went out. Yeah. So when the explosion happened, it blew us back. I'm thinking I'm standing on, a, on, on the landing. I'm actually holding on to a pole b above us. Really? And I had to climb back up because Hess is yelling, what do we do now? I said, there's only one thing we can do is, and it's go back up. So that's when we went back up to the eighth floor. And I busted out that window. Jennings very clearly said that he and Hess went into the World Trade Center Building 7 uh, very early, right after the first strike. So they were up there 
by about 9 o'clock. He's certain he was there at 9.03 when the second strike on the South Tower occurred. I got there, uh, I had to be inside on the 23rd floor when the second plane hit. And uh, shortly thereafter, they, they went down the stairs. Uh, the elevator wouldn't work, and Jennings said he was on the BBC show, he said he was going a landing at a time. I wanted to get out of that building in a hurry. So I started, instead of taking one step at a time, I'm jumping landings. And uh, so they were going down very fast. So that means they would have gotten down to the sixth floor by about 9.10 or 9.15 at the latest. And there was this huge explosion. They went back up to the eighth floor, broke a window. So what the, B the NIST said, uh, well, these two guys were in there and uh, they, they, uh, there was a big event, but it was just the North Tower coming, coming down. The North Tower collapses in just 11 seconds. This time, Tower 7 takes a direct hit from the collapsing building. Early evidence of explosives, or just debris from a falling skyscraper. Well, of course, that was 10.28, which is over an hour later. And uh, Hess remained silent, of course, all those years. And uh, then as soon as uh, Jennings dies, the BBC uh, interviews Hess. And Hess is free, you know, freely does an interview now and, of course, tells this new story and tells the timeline. My position, and I'm quite firm on it, there were no explosions. Did I feel the building shake? Absolutely, and I re recollect that. And I know now that that was caused by the northern half of number one falling on the southern half of our building. What have you heard at that stage by this? Have you heard any sounds like explosions or no, big sounds? No, nothing. You heard two things. You heard tremendous wind and you heard a tremendous number of sirens. And what have you heard at that stage by this? Have you heard any sounds like explosions or no, big sounds? No, nothing. You heard any sounds like explosions or no, big sounds? No, nothing. All this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. All this time I'm hearing explosions. All this time I'm hearing explosions. There was an explosion. The explosion was beneath me. When the explosion happened, it blew us back. I said I'm on the north side of the building because when I was on the stairs I saw north side. Some of the people out, then there's some secondary explosions and then some skin collapses. So I don't know how many people were in there. I know there's a, a lot of firefighters. But... New York's bravest never had a chance. We really never even got the, uh, cl that close to the building. The explosion blew and it knocked everybody over. The FBI is here, as you can see. They had woke this area off. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Most of the victims so far were people outside the blown up buildings. Like, it sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. To me it sounded like, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, then, then the building, the rolling sound sounded like the building collapsed. Where the floors collapsed down. I saw it blow and then ran like hell. Thank God. 
69, but I can still run. It just went boom, it was like a bomb went off. And it was like, it was like holy hell coming down them stairs. And then when we, we got, finally got to the bottom, we were coming out on a mezzanine level there. And then other explosions came out. Right yeah, yeah. Everyone's flying. Yeah, I just saw that as well. The second tower, the only one that was standing, tower number one. Just, uh, we saw some kind of explosion. A lot of smoke come out at the top of the tower. And then uh, it collapsed down onto the street. The next thing we know, it was blue room and the floor started shaking. And then we thought debris fall down. And next thing we know, we had to get out of the building. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby. This is big. Well, me and Mr. Hess, Corporation Council, were on the 21st floor. I told him we got to get get out of here. We started walking down the stairs and made it to the 8th floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the 8th floor. I was making my way to the foot of the World Trade Center suddenly while talking to an officer who was questioning me about my press credentials. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. We looked up and the uh, building literally began to collapse. Rose Arce, one of our CNN producers, is on the phone, Rose. What do you got? I'm about a block away, and there were several people that were hanging out the windows right below where the plane crashed, when suddenly you saw the top of the building start to shake, and people began leaping from the windows in the north side of the building. You saw two people at first plummet, and then a third one, and then the entire top of the building just blew up, and splinters of debris are falling on the street. When I try to say people, in a moment we heard a big explosion coming down. Everything just went black. Everything came down, glass stopped popping. People got hurt, stuff went on top of them. And it was a big explosion. Everything got dark, real dark, like snow. You can see behind me, oh, this is not snow. It's, this is all from the building. It was a terrible nightmare. Because I was down in the basement. All of a sudden, we heard a, a, a loud bang. And the elevator doors blew open. Some guy was, was burnt up. So I dragged him out. His, his skin was all hanging off. The streets of the financial district covered with debris, in some cases ankle deep. Cars on fire, cars just turned by the force of the explosions. It was like something no one had ever seen. This huge incredible force of wind and debris actually came up the stairs, uh, knocked my helmet off, knocked me to the ground. I was about five blocks away when I, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds and turn around to see the building we just got out of. Antenna tip over and fall in on itself. We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, was it, if it had detonated, it was a plan to yeah. take down a building. I go downstairs, the foreman tells me to go to remove the containers. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion of whatever happened, it threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com with your propaganda watch for September 10th, 2018. And since we are right on the cusp of the 17th anniversary of the 9-11 false flag attack, it is appropriate today that we examine some propaganda related to 9-11. And of course, there is no shortage of supply of such propaganda produced around the time of the 9-11 anniversary each year, this year being no exception. And surprise, surprise, today we'll be taking our cue from CNN. Not that they are uh, or the only propaganda outlet that is engaged in this type of disgusting um, skewing of 9-11 at this time of year, but they are the guilty ones in this particular case. September 11th terror attack fast facts from September 4th, 2018, which begins with this particularly telling slideshow. It's very interesting. So here is the iconic image of firefighters George Johnson, Dan McWilliams, and Billy Eisengrein raising a flag at Ground Zero in New York after the terror attacks on September 11, 2001. The scene was immortalized by photographer Thomas E. Franklin. The image has been widely reproduced in the decade since it was first published. And so there you go. There's, of course, the iconic propaganda image from 9-11, the firefighters raising the flag in the, in the rubble of uh, Ground Zero, which as they say, becomes this iconic image reproduced, for example, on uh, page 32 of uh, the record on September 12, 2001 in New Jersey. And then on The Sun, for example, and Newsweek and a number of other outlets. And then it became so iconic that they actually restaged the scene at the World Series that year involving, I think these are just random firemen, I don't think those are the actual, but anyway, restaging the scene for the 
onlookers at the World Series baseball game. And then you have, of course, on decorating the FDNY's trucks. And then you get commemorative coins and bronze statues. You get a commemorative stamp unveiled by none other than George W. And, of course, uh, um, unveiled to the public amongst much fanfare. You get it on the uh, hood of uh, racing cars. You have t-shirts. You have it on commemorative knives. Is there such a thing as a commemorative knife? You get these uh, snow globes. You get this one which is particularly disturbing, which is, of course, some some part of sculpture that has been created. But here it is being housed in the warehouse and the firemen being hung by the neck um, to keep them upright, I, I assume. A commemorative plate. Commemorative earrings. Earrings. Seriously. People are going to wear earrings of this flag raising. And then uh, art, artwork and pictures and what have you. So this is the propaganda image that is the image that speaks a thousand words about 9-11. All you need to know about 9-11 is in this image, right, guys? Because here it is, here's the destruction, but they're raising the American flag. It's this iconic moment in American history, and so it has been propagandized. And then, of course, after observing that little slideshow, then CNN gets into the fast facts about 9-11. You know, just to get caught up to speed on what this whole war of terror thing is about, just in case you forgot or didn't know in the first place. And non not very surprisingly, they go into exactly the type of facts that you would expect them to go into. The type that would be, uh, well, that is memorialized every single year in these never forget type articles. And I just wrote my own editorial about this, never forget what the deep state wants you to remember about 9-11, where I kind of satirize these types of articles and the types of fast facts that they generally provide you with. So if you haven't seen that yet, I suggest you go and check that article out. But, you know, it's the 19 men hijacking four fuel-loaded U.S. commercial airplanes. You know, all of the official story, uh, of course, exactly as it's presented by the 9-11 Commission report and the, the U.S. government. And they give the little timeline of the different things and then going on through the, uh, through the years. Uh, ultimately talking about how um, the firefighters, oh yeah, by the way, these firefighters, these iconic firefighters that we love and cherish and we will remember them forever, oh yeah, they all started dying from the dust relatively soon. You have um, people in 2002 already having been declared dead from the dust exposure, and then subsequent rulings later on that uh, lymphoma and lung disease and other uh, diseases are being attributed directly to exposure at ground zero. And then they just sort of mention, oh yeah, Obama signs the Zadroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act of 2010. So it kind of, oh, well, look, we were, we're paying them a, a bit of money to um, basically take care of the fact that, oh yeah, they kind of died or are dying as a result of 9-11 still. And then, uh, you know, they just kind of gloss over that and then back onto the fast facts about, oh, economic impact and clean up at ground zero. And oh yeah, by the way, the Homeland Security System was created as a result of uh, the, you know, the 9-11. So there you go. And that, that's what you need to know about 9-11. Now, obviously, again, that's not what you need to know about 9-11, but it's especially galling that they talk about, oh yeah, and people are dying of the dust and oh, they, but don't worry, the, the governments came in to save the day with this Droga Health Act and take care of these firefighters, basically. I mean, yeah, they're going to die, but at least they'll have some good medical treatment while they do, right? Well, that's probably not even true in and of itself, but of course, the excluded part of all of this is what I mentioned in last week's New World Next Week. Christine Todd Whitman and the EPA and the U.S. government knowingly, deliberately lying to all of the people who rushed into Ground Zero to basically kill them. Um, not just killing the people on the day, but killing people for years and years afterwards. If the brave men and women who had rushed to the World Trade Center in the chaotic days after 9-11 to help with the search and rescue had done so knowing the risks they were facing, that would be one thing. But of course they did not. They had been given false assurances by Christine Todd Whitman, the EPA administrator who assured the public just days into the cleanup that the air was safe to breathe. You know asbestos was in there, is in those buildings, lead is in those buildings, there are the, the VOCs. However, the concentrations are such that they don't pose a health hazard. 
Yes, they don't pose a health hazard. And of course, that wasn't the only statement. Uh, I, I Please do go and read through the whole transcript if you haven't yet. Uh, hyperlinks to all of the different statements and when they were made and and uh, the absolute bullet point case of how the Christine Todd Whitman and the EPA uh, killed and is still killing 9-11 first responders is in this report, which will obviously be linked up in the show notes. Um, truly uh, horrific. And of course, that is not the type of fast fact you're going to get from CNN about this. And so it is the case that the firefighters in this case are just a convenient prop to use for the propaganda of the mainstream establishment in, well, yeah, remember 9-11, but just kind of remember it vaguely with a couple of fast facts. I mean, don't actually think about what really happened that day or or in the subsequent days and weeks. Don't don't think about that too hard. Just, just trust us. Here are the facts that you need to know and uh, look at the firemen. And aren't they, aren't they so great? Oh, but they're dying now, but who cares? Um, and on that note, uh, for people who do check out the uh, Never Forget article that I, I just recently wrote satirizing this type of piece, uh, we had Corporate Report user SC Pat commenting, uh, nice piece, James. You covered so many important po points. As part of the Never Forget the Government Approved Official 9-11 Narrative articles referenced, the emotion I think they are intended to evoke is a swelling pride of patriotism. And then he points to a particular picture of a firefighter crying while nuzzling an American flag. Uh with the caption that they ran with on news.com.au, this guy wasn't alone in seeking comfort in a familiar symbol after the attacks. And doesn't that just summarize what this is all about? Of course, people do seek comfort from familiar symbols in the wake of any major traumatizing event. And that's, of course, exactly what 9-11 was intended to be when it was written about beforehand, the new Pearl Harbor referenced in uh, the PNAC document to, in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000, talking about the catalyzing and catastrophic event. And here is the myth-making that went on to make sure that that was emblazoned in people's mind. Remember, 9-11 means we were attacked, but don't worry, the firefighters and other brave heroes are going to raise the American flag and all will be well once we go and bomb Afghanistan and Iraq and end up in Libya and Syria and elsewhere. I mean, whatever. Don't think about the details. Just think about this image. This is what it is. Swell, swelling pride should be uh, filling your heart every time you see these dying first responders, because that's what America is about. Anyway, I just thought this is particularly galling piece of propaganda, and I wanted to uh, bring it to your attention, as we are, of course, entering the, uh, the most propagandistic part of the year yearly propaganda cycle. That's going to do it for today. I hope you do stay tuned because, of course, there is some very big coverage coming up very soon on CorbettReport.com. So please stay tuned for that. I'm James Corbett. Looking forward to talking to you again very soon. If, as the old adage has it, the first casualty of war is the truth, then it follows that the first battle of any war is won by lies. Lies have always been used to sell war to a public that would otherwise be leery about sending their sons off to fight and die on foreign soil. In times long past, this was easy enough to accomplish. A proclamation by a king or queen was enough to set the machinery of war in motion. But in the modern age of democracy and volunteer armies, a pretense for war is required to rally the nation around the flag and motivate the public to fight. That is why every major conflict is now accompanied by its own particular bodyguard of lies. From false flag attacks to dehumanization of the enemy, here are all the examples you'll need to debunk a century of war lies. This is the Corbett Report. In 1915, the RMS Lusitania, a British ocean liner en route from New York to Liverpool, was sunk by a German U-boat 11 miles off the coast of Ireland. The ship's sinking, which resulted in the death of 128 of the 139 Americans aboard, became a symbol of German evil and helped psychologically prepare the US public for their country's eventual entry into World War I. But every facet of the story of the Lusitania, as it has been presented to the public, was a deliberate lie or a lie by omission. The boat was not a purely civilian vessel carrying 3,813 40-pound unrefrigerated containers of cheese and 696 containers of butter 
as the official manifest held, but gun cotton, in keeping with the shipment's stated destination, the Royal Navy's weapons testing establishment. It was not sunk by the German torpedo boat, but by secondary explosions from the munitions the ship was illegally carrying. It was not the victim of a cowardly German surprise attack. The German embassy placed a warning notice about the Lusitania in 50 American newspapers right next to Cunard's own listings. And the American ambassador to England at the time, Walter Heinz Page, wrote to his son five days before the ship was sunk, asking, If a British liner full of American passengers be blown up, what will Uncle Sam do? That's what's going to happen. So what did the official cover-up of the incident conclude? That the dastardly Germans had waged a perfidious sneak attack on an innocent peace boat, of course. And the rest, as they say, is history. A little over two decades later, America's entry into World War II came when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, killing over 2,400 American servicemen and civilians. But far from an unprovoked sneak attack, as the official government-approved history would have you believe, Pearl Harbor is best understood as a conspiracy to motivate the American public for war by first provoking and then allowing a Japanese strike on American targets. This is not even a controversial idea. It was commonly understood and discussed by many in the Roosevelt administration at the time. Henry Stimson, the U.S. Secretary of War, noted in his diary that just the week before the attack, President Roosevelt had told him, we were likely to be attacked perhaps as soon as next Monday, and then solicited Stimson's advice on how we should maneuver them, the Japanese, into the position of firing the first shot without allowing too much danger to ourselves. Around the same time, Roosevelt sent a message to all military commanders stating that the United States desires that Japan commit the first overt act. So how did FDR and his administration provoke the Japanese into attacking? In late 1940, Roosevelt ordered the United States fleet to be relocated from San Pedro to Pearl Harbor. The order incensed Admiral James Richardson, commander-in-chief of the U.S. fleet, who complained bitterly to FDR about the nonsensical decision. It left the fleet open to attack from every direction, it created a 2,000-mile-long supply chain that was vulnerable to disruption, and it packed the ships in together at Pearl Harbor, where they would be sitting ducks in the event of a bombing or torpedo raid. FDR, unable to counter these objections, went ahead with the plan and relieved Richardson of his command. Then, in June 1941, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ikes wrote a memo advising FDR to embargo Japanese oil in order to goad them into war. There might develop from the embargoing of oil to Japan such a situation as would make it not only possible, but easy to get into this war in an effective way. Roosevelt followed three weeks later with an order seizing Japanese assets in America and effectively preventing Japan from purchasing much-needed American oil, which at that time accounted for four-fifths of Japanese oil imports. The provocations had their intended effect, and the Americans listened in on Japanese war preparations via radio. They received warnings of an imminent attack from diplomatic officials and military attaches. The attack was even predicted by the Honolulu Advertiser days before it happened. But all of these warnings were ignored. Even today, nearly 80 years after the events, new documents and memos continue to be found showing more warnings that Roosevelt and his administration deliberately ignored in the run-up to the attack. FDR got his wish. The Japanese attack was successful. 2,400 Americans died, and the nation, outraged, responded by rallying around the flag and jumping enthusiastically into war. But the Japanese themselves were no innocents when it came to lying their way into war. Ten years before Pearl Harbor, in 1931, Japan was looking for a pretext to invade Manchuria. On September 18th of that year, a lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army detonated a small amount of TNT along a Japanese-owned railway in the Manchurian city of Mukden. The act was blamed on Chinese dissidents and used to justify the invasion and occupation of Manchuria. When the lie was later exposed, Japan was diplomatically shunned and forced to withdraw from the League of Nations. The League of Nations fell apart precisely for its inability to prevent World War II. Its successor organization, the United Nations, 
engaged in its own war lies shortly after its creation to ensure that it would not meet the same fate. The Korean War, waged under the UN flag and sold to the public as a virtuous mission to save the South from the North's communist aggression, was on its face a war that should never have happened. The division of Korea into North and South was not the organic decision of the Korean people, but a plan that originated in an article in 1944 in Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, which suggested dividing the country up and putting its administration in the hands of the Allies, including the Soviets. When the newly founded UN put that plan into action in 1945, Korea was arbitrarily divided along the 38th parallel, with the US administering the South and the Soviet Union administering the North. Neither was the war itself the organic result of decisions taken by the Korean people. In 1949, Owen Lattimore, a member of the Carnegie and Rockefeller-funded Institute for Pacific Relations and an advisor to the State Department on East Asian Issues, wrote, The thing to do is let South Korea fall, but not to let it look as if we pushed it. In a speech at the National Press Club the following year, Secretary of State Dean Acheson placed Korea outside of the U.S.'s defense perimeter of the Pacific, stating that any attack that took place outside of that perimeter would have to be dealt with under the Charter of the United Nations. Taking this as a green light, the North Koreans, heavily fortified and equipped with Soviet military aid, invaded the South. The war began on June 27, 1950, when the UN Security Council passed a resolution calling for members to provide military assistance to restore international peace and security in the area. The Soviet Union, being a veto-wielding member of the Council, could have vetoed the resolution and prevented the UN from engaging in the war, but they abstained from the vote altogether. When General MacArthur, leading the UN forces, managed to repel the North right to the Chinese border, he was prevented from completing the mission by Truman, who would not authorize any operations north of the Soviet-held 38th parallel unless there was no chance of confrontation with either Chinese or Soviet forces. MacArthur, shocked by this development, wrote in a letter years later, such a limitation upon the utilization of available military force to repel an enemy attack has no precedent either in our own history or, so far as I know, in the history of the world. To me, it clearly foreshadowed the tragic situation which has since developed and left me with a sense of shock I had never before experienced in a long life crammed with explosive reactions and momentous hazards. In the end, the bloody Korean conflict ended not with a peace deal, but a ceasefire not with the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, but with the establishment of a demilitarized zone to keep them separated. Nearly three million civilians died during the fighting, and the country was torn to pieces, all in the name of a military action under the UN flag that should never have escalated into war in the first place. In August of 1964, President Johnson was preoccupied in finding an excuse to justify a formal escalation of American military involvement in Vietnam. That excuse came on August 2nd, when the USS Maddox, a destroyer supposedly on a peaceful mission in international waters, reported a surprise attack from North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. Just two days later, it reported another attack. Johnson responded by launching retaliatory strikes and signing the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, thus formally launching the Vietnam War. Years later, it was revealed that the story of the Maddox II had been a tissue of lies. The Maddox was not peacefully drifting near Vietnamese waters, minding its own business. It was part of a covert electronic warfare campaign assisting the South Vietnamese in launching attacks on the North. It had not been attacked out of the blue on August 2nd as originally reported, but in fact had fired first. And, as even the NSA's own internal publication, made available to the public for the first time 40 years after the incident, concluded, the second attack on August 4th had never taken place at all. But these were mere details, and just like the facts about the Lusitania and Pearl Harbor, these details were suppressed long enough for the event to have its intended effect, rallying the public for war. The Six-Day War in 1967 between Israel and Egypt, Syria, and Jordan is yet another example of a war which was justified for reasons that were later exposed as lies. When Israel launched an attack on Egypt's airfields on the morning of June 5th, 
they initially claimed that it was a defensive strike and that Egypt had struck first. But this was an easily proven lie, and the claim was quickly dropped. Next, they claimed that the attack was preemptive self-defense and that Egypt and its Arab allies had been preparing to strike Israel. But multiple Israeli officials, including Yitzhak Rabin, later admitted that Egypt had not been preparing a war or even interested in one. And then, in the most outrageous incident of all, Israel attempted to get America involved in the war by attacking the USS Liberty, a US technical research ship collecting electronic intelligence just outside Egypt's territorial waters at the time of the war. The attack, carried out by Israeli fighter jets and torpedo boats, was relentless. The Liberty was strafed and torpedoed repeatedly, with the crew sending distress messages and even hoisting a large American flag so there could be no doubt as to their identity. The Israeli attack was finally called off an hour and a half into the assault. Israel, caught in a blatant attempt to sink an American ship, offered an apology for mistaking the identity of the vessel. But it was no mistake. In 2007, the NSA declassified intercepts confirming that the Israelis knew they were attacking an American ship, not an Egyptian ship as their cover story is maintained. Even mainstream historians now characterize Israel's attack on the Liberty as a daring ploy by Israel to fake an Egyptian attack on the American spy ship and thereby provide America with a reason to officially enter the war against Egypt. But the incident was soon memory hold, and to this day, the Six-Day War is portrayed as an act of preemptive self-defense by the valiant Israelis against the dastardly Arab aggressors. By the 1990s, the post-Vietnam public was growing increasingly wary of calls for war in far-flung corners of the world in countries many had never heard of. And so it was that in 1990, when the politicians and their deep state controllers required the American public to be motivated to wage war against Iraq for its invasion of Kuwait, they hired a literal PR firm to sell an even more brazen set of lies to Joe Sixpack and Jane Soccer Mom. The most famous of these lies revolved around Nayira, a young Kuwaiti girl who sparked international headlines for her shocking testimony before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus in October 1990. In a tear-stained speech, she told a harrowing story of the horrors she witnessed being committed by Iraqi soldiers at a Kuwaiti hospital where she was volunteering. It's the second week after an invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the Al-Adan hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. It's difficult today to understand just how important this testimony was in setting the tone of the debate about whether America should commit military forces to defend Kuwait. It was reported breathlessly on the evening news, and it was repeated by President Bush on not one or two occasions, but six separate times in the lead-up to war. Babies pulled from incubators and scattered like firewood across the floor. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Then, when the Gulf War resolution was making its way through the House, the incubator story was raised in Congress. Now is the time to check the aggression of this ruthless dictator whose troops have bayoneted pregnant women and have ripped babies from their incubators in Kuwait. And then again in the Senate. The vote passed and combat operations formally began in January 1991. The only problem? Nayira was not some anonymous Kuwaiti girl, but, as a subsequent CBC investigation discovered, she was Nayira al-Saba, daughter of Saud al-Saba, the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. Her testimony had been written for her by Hill & Knowlton, a PR company hired by the Kuwaiti government-supported AstroTurf organization, the Citizens for a Free Kuwait, to help sell the Gulf War. And the Congressional Human Rights Caucus that held the hearing where Nayira gave her testimony? It was later found to be a Hill and Knowlton front itself. As everyone knows by now, 
the second Gulf War in 2003 was also built on lies. We all remember the lies about Saddam's WMDs and the way that story was sold to the public by Colin Powell at the UN. But this time, the media took the driver's seat in the campaign to sell the war to the public. The New York Times led the way with Judith Miller's now infamous reporting on the Iraqi WMD story, now known to have been based on false information from untrustworthy sources. But the rest of the media quickly fell into line, with the NBC Nightly News asking, what precise threat Iraq and its weapons of mass destruction pose to America? And Time debating whether Hussein was making a good faith effort to disarm Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Reports about chemical weapon stashes were reported on before they were confirmed, although headlines boldly asserted their existence as indisputable fact. And any media personality that showed skepticism about the claims being made, even wildly popular ones like Phil Donahue, host of MSNBC's then highest rated program, were summarily removed from the air. Scott Ritter is here and so is Ambassador Buck. You had Scott Ritter, who, former weapons inspector, who was saying that uh, if we invade, it'll be a historic blunder. Yes, now, but we didn't have Malone. He had to be there with someone else who supported the war. In other words, you couldn't have Scott Ritter alone. You could have Richard Furl alone. You could have the conservative. You could have the supporters of the president alone. And they would say why this war is important. You couldn't have a dissenter alone. Our producers were instructed to feature two conservatives for every liberal. You're kidding. No, this is absolutely Instructed true. from above? Yes. We now know that, in fact, the stockpiles did not exist, and the administration premeditatedly lied the country into yet another war. But the most intense opposition the Bush administration ever received over this documented war crime was some polite correction on the Sunday political talk show circuit. You and a few other critics are the only people I've heard use the phrase immediate threat. I didn't. The president didn't. And uh, it's become kind of folklore that that's, that's what's happened. The president went... You're saying that nobody in the administration uh, said I, that? I can't speak for nobody and everybody in the administration and say nobody said Vice that. Vice president didn't say that? Not, if you have any citations... Uh, I'd like to see him. Yeah, here it says, some have argued that the, nu this is you speaking, some have argued that the nuclear threat from Iraq is not imminent, that Saddam is at least five to seven years away from having nuclear weapons. I would not be so certain. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, it's close to imminent. <laughs> well, um, I, I tried to be precise and I've tried to be accurate. I'm so No terrorist state poses a greater or more immediate threat to the security mm -hmm. of our people and the stability of the world than the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Mm -hmm. The WMD story blew up in the neocons' face shortly after the war, but by that time they had already succeeded in their plan to reshape the Middle East. But for the would-be controllers of public opinion, a valuable lesson was learned. Human rights and protecting the innocent is a more effective lie to sell to the public to motivate them for war. So when it came time to sell the war on Libya to the public, the UN-backed NATO-led aggressors once again donned the cloak of human rights by turning to none other than the UN's Human Rights Council. The process that launched the intervention was begun by a coalition of 70 non-governmental organizations, which issued a joint letter urging the UN to suspend Libya from the Human Rights Council, and for the Security Council to invoke the so-called responsibility to protect principle in protecting the Libyan people from alleged atrocities being committed by the Libyan government. In a special session on the issue on February 25, 2011, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution affirming the NGO's recommendations. The resolution was adopted without a vote. The Security Council immediately passed resolutions 1970 and 1973, authorizing the establishment of a no-fly zone on Libyan military aviation for the protection of civilians and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Three days later, using the resolution as its justification, the US, UK and France began bombing the population of Libya. Meanwhile, the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo, began working on the legal basis for the invasion. He drafted the request for the court's judges to issue an arrest warrant for Gaddafi for crimes against humanity. Although NATO forces were already engaged in an invasion of the country on the basis of undocumented allegations by a group of NGOs, Moreno Ocampo's request was not issued until May 16th. On June 28th, 
The day after the judges agreed to issue the warrant, Moreno Ocampo participated in a press conference in which one reporter asked about the evidence that Gaddafi had ever engaged in the atrocities he was accused of. I advise you to read the application of the prosecutor's office, many pages, I think it was 77 pages. We describe in detail the facts, most of it is public, and the judges also decided analyzing the evidence. So, of course, we are prosecutors and judges, so we rely on facts. So we prove the crimes. That's what we did. Although the document that Moreno Ocampo urges the public to read to understand the evidence of Gaddafi's crimes is indeed public and is 77 pages long, the version made available to the public has been heavily redacted. In fact, of the 77 pages, 54 of them have been redacted, comprising the entire section of the document dealing with the evidence for the charges themselves. The most sickening part of this war lie is just how obvious it was. No one involved in this charade cared about the well-being of the Libyan people. Not the press. Not the politicians. Not the ICC prosecutors. And as a result, today, seven years after the destruction of Libya at the hands of the United Nations-sanctioned NATO saviors, open-air slave markets are running in the country that the human rights crusaders once pretended to care about. False flags, provocateur conflicts, fake news and fake human rights crusades. Throughout the last century, a host of methods have been employed to keep the public playing the military-industrial complex's game. And over that century, the blood of untold millions has flowed as a direct result of these war lies. Truth is the first casualty of war, as they say. But if we desire peace, then we must confront the liars with our knowledge of these war lies. And armed with this truth, the public finally stands a chance of stopping the next war before the warmongers can conjure it into existence.